Hello and welcome to Politics Today. I'm Kayo Okikulu here in the nation's capital, Abuja. Well, President Mohamed Buhari is back in the country from his trip to Cote d'Ivoire, where he attended the 15th session of the Conference of the Parties, otherwise called COP15. Now, on the sidelines of the main event, President Buhari, who is also the president of the Great Green Wall in Africa, called for the creation of a task force to accelerate the initiative to combat desertification in the Sahel region. Well, after his arrival, uh, the president received an audience the governor of Ebony State, David Mai, at the State House, who came to thank the president for visiting his states a few days ago. I was speaking to State House correspondent. After his visit, Governor Mai responded to reports linking former President Goodluck Jonathan to the APC presidential race, saying that if he eventually joins the APC, it will be a material for the World Book of Records. And over at the National Assembly, the Senate is again amending the 2022 Electoral Act to make provision for delegates who will not be elected as ad hoc delegates to participate in the elections, congresses, conventions, and of course, meetings of political parties. The bill sponsored by Deputy Senate President Ovia Omagege seeks to amend Section 84 Sub 8 of the 2022 Electoral Act. Senator Omagege believes the clause is an error which will be corrected to allow statutory delegates to partake in party primaries. Well, for the Green Chamber, the Clerk of the House of Representatives, Yahya Danzeria, has asked members to reconvene for an emergency plenary session tomorrow at 11 a.m. He says the session is to amend a fundamental error in the Electoral Act, which needs the attention of all members. Well, it is believed that this is connected to, to the move by the Senate. Well, don't forget the Electoral Act was assented to by President Buhari in February, but some sections remain the subject of contention. First, Section 8412, which bars political appointees from voting or being voted for in party elections, is still in court. And now this one. But we'll see how this one plays out. Let's head over to the political parties now. The window for aspirants seeking the APC presidential forms is closing today. Well, yesterday we saw some last-minute moves to purchase the forms on behalf of some aspirants, but today was much more quiet. In total, as at the last count, 28 forms, that's presidential, nomination, and expression of interest forms, have been purchased. Now, those aspirants have till tomorrow to fill the forms and submit to the party with the appropriate documents attached. Now the next hurdle for them is a screening which will hold on Saturday May the 14th and then the big one which is the primaries will hold between Monday May the 30th and Wednesday June the 1st. Now that is just two days to the June 3rd deadline which was set by INEC. The opposition PDP had stopped its sale of forms back in April and fixed May the 20th for its presidential primaries. Now, speaking of the dates, the Interparty Advisory Council, IPAC, is asking for a two-month extension of the 2023 general elections timelines, as stipulated by the Independent National Electoral Commission. Specifically, the political parties want changes to the party primaries timeline. Well, this was presented during a meeting hosted by the chairman of a commission with leaders of political parties in attendance at the INEC headquarters in Abuja. But the chairman... Professor Mahmoud Yakubu told the party leaders that the commission will not review the existing timelines. Well, former Deputy Governor of the CBN, Professor Kingsley Moalu, has formally joined the 2023 presidential race after uh, doling out the required 25 million naira to obtain the presidential forms of the African Democratic Congress. That's uh, ADC, uh, Professor Moalu told uh, newsmen at the ADC National Secretariat that politics in Nigeria should be detribalized for the nation to grow and take its rightful place in the Committee of Nations. In fact, he noted that competent leaders are, are found in all tribes and religions, adding that it was high time that technocrats, intellectuals and experienced people took power from Nigeria's career politicians. So intelligence is very important. The coordination of Nigeria's intelligence and the coordinated function of its intelligence agencies, very important. Also, the matter of political will, like I said, you may have intelligence, but if you don't have political will, you will not act on your intelligence. 
So we've had statements in this country by highly placed political leaders. Oh, we know where they are. Oh, some people know where they are. What is going on? It's an indication of, you know, something that is not totally correct. So, and we will, of course, reform the Nigerian police. The breakdown in security in this country begins with the breakdown of the Nigerian police function. It is the police force that primarily secures a community. And if the police force is not functioning well, then other problems begin. Well, tonight on the program, we'll be speaking with two presidential aspirants. They have both been senator, governor, and now they're seeking the number one seat. It promises to be an enlightening conversation, that I can tell you. But first, uh, let's bring you other top political stories on our political roundup. <clears throat> A coalition of civil society organizations in Abuja are calling for the immediate sack and prosecution of all political appointees who refuse to resign from office before joining the race for elective offices in the 2023 general elections. Speaking at a joint news conference in Abuja, the executive director of Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, CISLAC, Mr. Awal Johnny, describes it as shameful that the incumbent government could allow its appointees to go into contest while still holding office. And for the Conference of Nigeria Political Parties, the decision of the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria to veer into the political arena by indicating the presidential ambition is an aberration. The group advocates the need for President Buhari to immediately sack the CBN governor over what they describe as the desecration of the office of the apex banker. River State Governor Yesim Wiki has continued to consult with delegates of the People's Democratic Party in his quest to clinch the party's presidential ticket at its primary this month. This time, Governor Wike is meeting with party leaders in Ekiti and Ondo states, where he explained his concept in rescuing Nigeria and the need for the PDP to field a credible candidate in the coming presidential election. Nigeria has never been divided like this. God did not make a mistake. That was in Nigeria. By the grace of God, when we win, first thing we will do is to form a government of national unity and bring everybody together. The People's Democratic Party in Abia State says it is not satisfied with the three-man delegate congress purportedly carried out in the state. Addressing journalists at the party secretariat in Umaya, the state PDP secretary David Iro says the party will not accept any imposition of candidate as such may result in the party losing in the forthcoming election. He is also appealing to parties stalwart in the state to resolve their differences. It is high time the caucus of this party meets to resolve every lingering issues, every burning issues that is affecting this party so that we can move. As the political terrain begins to take shape ahead of 2023, the senator representing Oyo Central Senatorial District in Oyo State, Senator Teslim Folarin, says he is poised to rescue Oyo State as he declares to contest the governorship election. Also, it was a major boost of the camp of the opposition All Progressives Congress in the state as Senator Kola Balogun defects from the ruling People's Democratic Party to the APC. Senator Balogun is the only PDP senator in Oyo State. At the Okeado Party Secretariat of the APC, the new entrant, Senator Balogun, was given the flag of APC, signaling his official acceptance to the party. With this move, the APC now has all the three senators from Oyo State in its fold. Tonight, we're continuing with our mandate to bring you closer to those vying for leadership positions in the country and interrogate their plans and vision for Nigeria if they're elected into office. This is essentially meant to help our viewers know what to expect, the kinds of promises to hold them to, and of course, to make the selection process easier for you. And our first guest tonight is one of those vying uh, for the position, the top position in the country, is the first civilian governor of Zamfar State, serving two terms from May 1999 to May 2007 on the ticket of AMPP. He then served as Senator uh, for Zamfar West and Deputy Minority Leader 
in the Senate. Today, he is a member of the APC and one of the 28 presidential aspirants in the party. Senator Sonny Yerima is our guest tonight. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you very much. I, I know that you had been speaking about this. I mean, you had even, you know, tried to run. We'll get to that. But seeing that you have, you know, gone through with this this time, I'd like to know first, simply by asking, uh, how are you confident that Nigerians would want you as their president? Well, you see, as a Nigerian, like you said, who has served uh, this country uh, many places, was governor two terms, and senator for 12 years, and I've worked in Central Bank, and I believe that uh, Nigerians now know that at least is Yerima is somebody who has seen a lot in governance, and who has enough experience to run the country. Okay, so I understand your pedigree. Yeah. And you've been governor, senator, you've had experiences across the board. Yeah. But there's always a question as to what influences politicians, what makes them want to you know, run for positions. We can understand governorship, senatorial. But for the president, which is the number one position in the country, and I'll ask again, how are you convinced that not just from your side, but from the side of Nigerians yeah. across North, <clears throat> South, all the regions. How are you convinced, confident, that they actually want Senator Sonny Yerima as their president? You see, in politics, people look at your performance in previous offices. And uh, to be confident that you can handle a higher office. If you have done very well and the people respect you, they have seen that you have achieved a lot in the offices you held. They view confident that they can give you, you know, uh, their support to run for a higher office. So it was my former, I believe that my performance in the forest state and in the National Assembly is open to all Nigerians. And the interactions I had with them in terms of, uh, I had so many, many interviews in the media. They have known me. They have known who is a Rima, and I'm sure they are confident that at least I've been able to, over these years, X-ray the problems of Nigeria. And like I said, when I said I was going to run, I rolled out three-point agenda, which is open to the you know nation. Mm. Yeah. What, what kind of feelers are you getting from the people? I'd like you to speak specifically. What kind of feelers are you getting, maybe from your people in, in the north, your people in the south, general Nigerians? How, help us understand, in terms of consultations, I imagine you've gone around, you've spoken to people. What kind of feelers are you getting from those people? And you see, just how much is that spread? With the age of technology, you see the social media now, you can assess yourself and accessibility from the public. The social media is working hard. I mean, it's very open and transparent. I have seen responses from Facebook, from Instagram, from uh, other social media operators. So I'm sure that uh, the interaction I have with also my associations, I have more than 1,000 support groups that have been working since 2019. My aspirations did not start today. Like you said, in 2007, I came forward, but I had to withdraw for Mr. President that time. And in 2013, I created an association called the Rima Support Organization, which has been working mobilizing Nigerians. Mm -hmm. And we are using technology. That we had an application that in, in the iOS, the app, if you have Apple iPhone or you have Android, you can go and Google and see. I have more than 15 million supporters now. 15 million. In the system, yes, yes. And you, you think Recorded that translates to 15 million? With their million telephone calls. numbers, with their pictures, you can get in touch with them through the app. So you have 15 million registered users on your app so far, yes. What, what's the app called? The YSO. The yeah, YSO. Support organization, yes. So you have 15 million downloads. We have already 15, 8 million downloaded in the system. And we have forms that we have printed and returned. We have more than 7 million forms. So what would you have to describe your approval ratings then? Because you said you are deploying technology, which yes. is a quite interesting perspective to all of this. What would you say your approval rating is for Nigerians? Well, I, I think, as I said, uh, if you look at the previous elections, most of the presidential 
president that have won election, won with 15, 16, 17 million votes. Mm -hmm. So I'm very confident that uh, with the kind of support and followers I've already seen, it's possible that uh, Yarima can still be the next president, inshallah. Well, you, you talked about the time you had to step down for then candidate Buhari, who is now um, president. And there will always be questions as to, maybe that's your game plan this time around. Throw your hat in the ring. I mean, show that you have a lot of support. You've said how many? 17 million? Yes, or 15 million. 15 million. 15 million. Yes. I mean, show that and then use that as a bargaining chip. Maybe step down and vie for another office like you did the last time. It was a senatorial office you went for. So how is this time different? You see, in 2007, every Nigerian knew that uh, Iowa Consultative Forum under the leadership of Chief Sunday Aoni came forward and endorsed Muhammad Buhari as the northern candidate. And they, don't, they didn't stop that. They set up committees and uh, mobilized to consult us and tried to convince us that there is need for unity at that time. And they convinced me. And uh, they told us, and they talk, spoke about the pre-degrees of uh, Mr. President then. And I accepted, so I was due for him. But this time around, and at that time, when I withdrew in 2007, I also pledged that so long as he's interested in running for political office, I will not run against him. And that's what kept me out of the context for presidential election. But now he has done his second term. And I believe that uh, at my age, at the age of 62, because that time they say I was very young, I was 47 that I still have time. And by the grace of God, I have seen that they were, you know, uh, they are right to say that uh, I can still run in the, in the future. And uh, that's why I'm running now. So you're not going to be stepping down for well, anybody? Well, you see, in politics, every politician believes, especially Nigerians, and generally Africans who have religion. Like in Nigeria, we have Christian Muslims, and we believe in the power of God. We believe that it is God that bestows power. As a loyal political, I mean, as a loyal party member, if my party comes out to say that uh, today, Yerima, um, the party, in the interest of the party, this game should go to this area or that area or this person, if they can convince me, I am telling you, I believe that it means that God has destined that it is still not time. But I. It's not a do or die affair. I well, believe that uh, I will sell my ideas right. to Nigerians, and then they will see what I have for Nigeria. And I think this lends credence to that yes. thinking out there, political yeah. pundit saying, this is all just to get bargaining chips, yeah. throw your hat in the ring, yeah. and use it as a no, way no, to no, bargain no, eventually. No, nobody, no, no, no good politician will do that. Well, I mean, I this, do these the are things we see I from the time, last time to time. No, no, you have, you have not many people doing that. You see, credibility of individual matters. Right. You will not be a credible politician if today you run into for an office, you withdraw. Like I told you, I contested for governorship. I won two times. I went to the Senate three times. It was only one time I attempted. And this is my second attempt. Okay. So um, we'll talk about your plans, what yeah. kind of president you want to be. But Amidst all this conversation about um, justice, fairness, and equity, you are from the same region as President Muhammad Buhari. Do you think that's in line with the conversation, the mood of the nation, you stepping out? The same Northwest region, do you think that's in line with the mood, the call for justice, equity, and fairness? You see, I don't understand why people don't even, what is the definition of justice, equity, and fairness in politics? There is one single document that is called Constitution. And that Constitution determines what the politics should look like. In Nigerian Constitution today, they only talk about a Nigerian. Let me give you an example of the United States of America. President George Bush Sr. was president while his two children were governors of different states of America. And he was succeeded later after Bill Clinton 
by his son. On what basis so do you the, compare the fact is Nigeria that, yeah, with yeah, the United States? Because States. you see, democracy is about people. Well, we have it's not about okay, the age tomorrow, of our democracy. Tomorrow is, you start talking about uh, is, is way off the age let me, of America's let me give you democracy. Example. Let, me give you, let me give you one example. So if you say there should be rotational presidency, suppose it is being included in the constitution, it has to go down to local government level. We have 774 local governments, and we have over 360 exit group. Then you start saying Hausas, Ibos, Yorobas, mm. Eshekiri, Ijos. This are time. This are time. Where there is is better for all of us to start thinking, looking at Nigeria as a country, and in, uh, look at the citizenship concept. We are all citizens of Nigeria, and we also get educated to work in line with our constitution. There is no way you can go outside the right. constitution and play politics. Well, you've, you've been in politics since 1999, in fact, before that, yeah. clearly. And uh, listening to uh, the aspirant of the ADC, uh, Professor Kingsley Moalu, he says it's time to actually remove career politicians. That's, and that's, and you will qualify as one if there was anything like career politician, you know, essentially. I, 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 he said what do you think about that? He said technocrat. Yes. I worked in the civil service and rose to the position of permanent secretary. I was in the CBN, so I was also, I am also, I can call myself a qualified technocrat. You see now not in politics. So you're not so a career politician? So who is a career politician? You see these definitions. Some people try to play on ignorance of people, mm -hmm. of others. Because he is also a politician. Everybody who p p brings himself forward to contest an office is a politician. What is the definition of politician? So let him define who is a politician, who is a, who is a technocrat. Okay, so um, what kind of president would you be if you were elected? First, if you get your party's ticket, and eventually if you're elected as president, what kind of president would you be? Somebody who will want to leave a legacy of justice, equity, and fairness, like you said. How? Um, today, Nigerians are so divided. They are talking of ethnicity, they are talking of religion. But I want to go and introduce three point agenda, like I said. First of all, we look at the issue of security. And secondly, we look at the issue of poverty and then ignorance. For, for ignore, security, I believe that uh, Nigeria is under policed greatly and grossly under policed. I always give example with a country in Africa, Ethiopia. They have a population of about 50 million, but they have more than 1 million police officers, men and women. So how many are you Nigeria, uh, today, Nigeria? we have less than 500,000 policemen. How many do you think we should have? I, we should have not more than, not less than 1 million police officers as well. How would you, so how I would you carry to, that burden in terms to, of uh, you see, you know, equipping them remuneration? Don't forget the government look, announced an increment in salary December. Let, let me tell you. And until and today, it took a while before we saw that. It, it, it requires, it requires uh, somebody who knows how to create using physical and monetary right, I mean, policy, physical and monetary policy to make sure that uh, government revenue base is increased and making sure that uh, there is proper allocation of resources. So you think this government I, does not know how to do no, that? No, 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 as they are doing their best. You see, every time problems of Nigeria are is, you know, dynamic, they changes. When Mr. President was selected, the major problem we are facing was corruption. Very high and very serious level of corruption. So he came with three-point agenda. He said he's going to address the issue of corruption, He's going to now address the issue of insecurity. At that time, there was issue of Boko Haram. In fact, they have already almost captured Borno Ayobe State, mm. and they have even come to Abuja and bombed the UN headquarters. So today, he has done his best in these two areas. Boko Haram's are out of sight, and it's only issue of economy. When he was elected, the crude oil price was up to $140 a barrel. But shortly after he was sworn in, the price, you know, reduced to barely about $30 a barrel. Even though it has so increased those are yet big again. challenges. It is now going up. Yes. Now. So you can see that uh, 
time and time, you know, times are different. Mm. And you see, every government will have a different strategy based on particular problems they have seen. The major problem in security today is associated with poverty. You know, Once you can address the issue of poverty in right. Nigeria today, most other problems will be resolved. And it's interesting you made that point. Uh, we're winding down in a few minutes, and I'd like to take you up on these issues. You talked about poverty, and yeah. I mean, you are one of those who championed Sharia law as yeah. far back as 1999, and others followed suit. And you know, part of the reasons uh, that you thought this would work is to ensure transparency, reduce corruption, improve the livelihoods generally, governance structure in the northern states then. Would you say that 20 years down the line, over 20 years, the north is better off with the Sharia law? Well, during my time, yes. But today, you see, is it? because uh, well, it depends on who is in the system, in, in, on the on the, on on on, on in government. government. During my time, you check records, President Obasanjo declared in his government, the IG, said that the Ampara state is virtually zero, you know, crime, is crime-free state. They describe, I don't know what calculate, I mean, method they use, they say crime rate in Zamfara at that time was 2%, I mean 0.2%. So the fact is that once you have Sharia at that time, you know, Sharia means justice, equity, and fairness. Ask the Christian in Zafara. They will tell you that at that time, they were better off. Recently, when I declared in Abuja, the chairperson, Christian, I mean, uh, uh, Christian Association of Nigeria of Zafara, was there, Ms. Lamy. And she, has, she told Nigerians what kind of benefit the Christian had. There was social justice, but that's not the case today. There was because development. Because if we look at the state of security or insecurity in some first state, or today, in northern states it, generally, it's just a new dimension. School enrollment. And, and this is not just no, school, a, a, a year check, ago. Check the records of school enrollment. I created, you know, female education. No, not at your time. The UNICEF gave figures recently about yeah. out-of-school children yes. in Nigeria, majority yeah. in the north. But, yeah. you know, these lots of issues really to take up with you. But yeah. let's see if we can anchor on, on this one. Because you've had quite some controversial moments, really. Yeah. And some will say you handled them quite well. In fact, some went to court like this Sharia and yeah. it came out in your favor. Some yeah. you spoke to uh, directly. Because it was constitutional. And one of, one of those controversial moments that is quite conspicuous for a lot of Nigerians is that time, the marriage uh, that you had with a young girl. And, and that caused quite a stare in the country at that time. And incidentally, or do I say coincidentally today, there is a case in court about some minors who were involved in alleged sexual conduct. And I wonder for you, um, did you cringe when you saw that story that concerned those students in you see, You see, sexual conduct is different from marriage. You see, that's why I said ignorance is our problem. You can see a professor who does not know the law, who does not know anything about constitution. The constitution of Nigeria, that is why, like you said, whatever happened that time was history. If I had done anything wrong, I would have been taken to court. The NAPTIP wanted to try the case, and they dropped the matter because I didn't do anything wrong. Whatever you are doing, if you are ignorant of the law, then you are you, you are bound to have problems. But once you do any action based on law and according to law, you don't have problem in any society. So did you, did you, did that matter worry you? Did it How concern can it you? matter? Because you see, I did nothing wrong. No, 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 I'm talking about the, the incident see, that involved whatever, whatever, the minors. That is, that is antisocial activity. We're talking of marriage. You go to any society in Nigeria, any society, traditional society, do they have any age bracket for marriage? There is no law, there is no law in Nigeria that determine when and how you get married. The Muslims have Sharia, the Christians, I don't know what the you know, doctrine says, but as far as we are concerned, you have to do everything you want to do in Nigeria, in any society. Even though to there will be inferences to, according uh, to the law. Child Rights Act yeah. and, and, and others. But, Clearly, uh, so many issues to raise, but because of time, Senator, we have to anchor at this point. But we wish you the very best in, in this ambition. I mean, 28 aspirants in your political parties. I wonder how the primaries will go and the horse trading. But we'd like to thank you so much. Thank you very uh, much. for your time. Uh, but.
Before we close, let me just ask you this, yeah, yeah. because I mean, it, it's a matter that a lot of people are quite interested. W would you still consider marrying a minor, 13 year old, or I mean, you didn't give the age of, of your bride at that time, yeah, yeah. but would you see, is that something you'll still you consider? You see, like I said, you don't talk about any age when you're going to marry. I don't know your own society, but under our own system, under Sharia, there are criteria that are followed. So once anything I want to do is according to law of Nigeria, there's nothing stopping me from doing it. So you don't mind a 13 year old? Anything, anything that is according to the law, I cannot do anything unlawful or illegal. You will not find Yerima doing anything illegal in this country. Just, just to be clear, because a lot of Nigerians are watching, yeah. is marrying a 13 year old wrong? It depends on the society. It depends on your understanding of what is minor. You, it's not wrong. I don't think you, you, you... Look, the issue of age. Where do you have any issue of age in our law? Tell me. If the law says this is the age of a child, or I mean girl or woman, that you, want, you must marry, then the law has to be uh, followed. Mm. So as far as I'm concerned, my society does not determine even the constitution of Nigeria. There's no law in Nigeria today right. that stipulates the age of marriage. Well, it's, it's, I'm so glad it's you ignorance. To that. People are, can be educated in Western well, sense. I'm, I'm sure our listeners are, are quite of interested their law, in of this their one. Society. But it's good to have you speak to that because yeah. it's like the elephant in yeah, the room. Yeah, yeah. I would like to thank you so much once again. We're totally out of time. I had thank to make you, an exception sir. for you. you. We've been speaking with Senator Sonny Yerima, former governor of Zamfara State, a former senator, and now is running, or at least vying, uh, for the office of the number one citizen in the country. Thank you. For your Thank time you very much. Thank you very much. Well, we'll go on a break now. And when we return, we'll be talking to yet another presidential aspirant. It just keeps getting more interesting. Professor Ben Ayade, the governor of Cross River State, is our guest in a moment. Stay with us. Our next guest is an environmental microbiologist turned politician. He's also a lawyer and um, a lecturer. He ventured into elective office in 2011 as a PDP senator, and four years later, he was elected governor of Cross River State. He is currently serving his second term as an APC governor, and now he's seeking to clinch his party's presidential ticket. Professor Ben Ayade joins us tonight on the program. Your Excellency, thank you for sparing us your time tonight. Well, let, let's start from what a lot of Nigerians saw yesterday. You received your forms from so-called sons and daughters of Cross River State, Arawa youths, and other interest groups across the country's six geopolitical zones. I'd just like to know, how were you able to rally them together uh, to carry out such huge task? Oh, it's very simple. I have a long-standing history as governor when I was expanding my government. I ensured that all ethnic nationalities were brought on board in my government. Ariwa Youth, my legal advisor, is from Kano State. The man who is in charge of my internal audit, Alaji Rabilu, is from Katsina State. I have my head of media, who is an Igbo man. I have the person who is in charge of my religious activities, is Yoruba. I have all states and all ethnic groups are represented in my government. And so it's very easy for us to fellowship with their various constituents in their home states. And so there's no difficulty. And for some long time, I'm the highest financier of pilgrims to Mecca every year as governor who is a Christian and from the southern part of Nigeria. And so I really have a large fellowship across the country. And this might believe in the unity and oneness of Nigeria. So it wasn't difficult for me to actually rally all of these people together. More so that my chief of staff and Alaji Sanusi were really on top of it, and Alaji Aminu Bala were really on top of putting this together. So what do you say then uh, to those who say, well, all of these groups come in to pick forms and, and all of that. It's just, you know, those who are interested, the politicians like you, actually doing this by proxy. What do you say to them? Well, I will confine my response to my circumstance. In my case, I never made any proxy contribution. Indeed, what has happened it was an organic contribution from people who have, at one time or the other, uh, maybe perhaps have a relationship with me. 
and of course those who have watched my programs in the course of time having seen my egalitarian fair and balanced approach and my interest in the, the unity of this country may have become interested in giving me support uh, again if you have applied in other circumstances but not certainly not in my circumstance right so l let's talk about your ambition and the road ahead so today is a final day for those who want to pick uh, the forms tomorrow is a deadline for you know submission by the way have you submitted i'm submitting tomorrow tomorrow just on the deadline date right so uh, the, the coming days will be quite interesting really because uh, we're looking at how the apc will be able to cut down 28 uh, aspirants is it going to be by you know consensus or they'll have to go through primaries don't forget that your primaries will be concluded just two days uh, before the deadline by INEC how confident are you really of clinching your party's ticket amidst you know other aspirants uh, let me just add that you are sort of a newcomer to the APC compared to some others you just joined the party less than two years ago so how confident are you I'm extremely confident on the superabundance and audacity of my achievements and accomplishments. So I know politics doesn't classify capacity as an essential tool, obviously because the factors that gives you the proper candidacy or qualifications that will make you a competent and capable uh, politician or leader are the same things that disqualify you and make you unsuitable for picking up tickets. In other words, the stronger you are, the weaker you are in actual fact in politics. But I've seen that uh, APC might present a different story. So my calculation and my confidence is originating from the fact that APC will want to present a candidate who will be able to unite this nation. And I have credentials to demonstrate that I have the goodness and fairness of heart to unite this nation. For example, all Southern governors took a decision for to put a ban to open grazing and to sign the bill of open grazing banning open grazing signing it into law and i said i was not going to illegitimize a legitimate trade of a people and i refused to sign that law i did so because i believe that it was inappropriate to decide that headers should have no access to the green pastures in a southern part of the country when we know that during the dry seasons, these people have to migrate to be able to sustain their cattle. I did so not because my father or my people are headsmen, but I just think that that is what is right, and that they have right as Nigerians to go wherever they choose to go. Rather, I also knew that it was wrong for our, the farmers' crops to be eaten by these cattle. So I did a balancing law that was sensitive to the concerns of the farmers, while not also closing the fundamental rights of headers to have access to pasture. That showed clearly that I care about this nation and I believe in the unity and oneness of this country. Two, when the issue of pasture became critical, I decided on my own as a professor of science to start some research works and came out with a king grass, which grows into maturity in 45 days and starts regenerating every 15 days. So the more you cut, the faster it grows. To be able to produce a rice system that can guarantee pasture. I have also employed and engaged a lot of people. The Bakasi Deep Sea Port with the superhighway is to empty into northern Nigeria. To be able to create an evacuation corridor for the vast natural huge resources and the agricultural wealth of northern Nigeria. Mm. And so for everything I do, trying to bring Atlantic Ocean close to northern Nigeria, for me, I, I have done what I can to ensure that North and South see a harmony, have an embrace. So right. these credentials will speak for me strongly as somebody who believes in uniting this nation, which well, is the biggest spoken, challenge of this country at this time. Well, haven't spoken about your credentials, at least part of it. Uh, I'd also go back to that point about what goes on within your parties, or your party in this case. Uh, would you, in any case, be stepping down if your party says, we're going the way of consensus. We have a candidate which we think, well, will carry us through all the way. Would you step down in any scenario? The scenario where the party creates a very classical elucidation of the basis and selection criteria that I find completely adequate 
I will have no objection. I'm a team player, and I don't have any uh, qualms with that. But I must see that it is fair, it's balanced, it's transparent. And I know that capacity will be one of the key factors in consideration. I've had a very, very robust private experience in my private oil and gas business. I've been a lecturer and a professor in the university. And I've been a lawmaker as a senator. I'm a lawyer and now an executive governor. I have transversed walls. And as executive governor, I've done the longest dual career road in any governor's history. I pride myself. I have almost 30 factories to my credit. No governor has built the quantity of factories I've built in this country. And so I wouldn't know what selection process that would exclude me. Uh, and with all humility, I have almost seven degrees to my credit. So I'm, I'm, I'm balanced, well, properly educated, very civilized and right. very humane, coming from a very poor background, highly weaponized by my childhood poverty, and highly informed by my education. I have okay. all it takes. If we could just backtrack a bit, uh, I mean, let's step this down. What did you mean by uh, the, the classical elucidation? I, I didn't quite get those terms. I, I know you're used to terms like that, but what did you mean exactly? I mean that if the basis for narrowing down to somebody on a consensus basis, and I don't happen to be the one, I need to understand the basis, the selection criteria to elucidate, to explain, to break down to me how they arrived at Mr. A and not B. I see. And that if I feel that that is a fair process, of course, I will yield to the supremacy of the party. All right. So let's talk about some of your plans for Nigeria, um, because, I mean, that's a big picture for everyone. And, and uh, I mean, you know the problems, you know the challenges we're faced with as, as a nation. What for you is the biggest issue we need to resolve in Nigeria as of today? A security above education, above unemployment, at the heart of the challenge of this session today is security. And after security comes employment, after that comes power, then you get to education. But fix the security, fix power, and all other things would align. Security is the fundamental challenge of this nation at this time. We are the threat of almost breaking this nation. The northern part of this country could could have, could have faced a more cataclysmic situation. Because with the collapse of Afghanistan, giving room to the free movement of ISIS and ISWAP, it then means that the northern part of Nigeria, and as they ingress downwards, the deliberate effort by this Islamic state of West African province, who believe that West Africa is their God-given province, and that the Christians and the Muslims alike who are resident in Nigeria today are all infidels because the Muslims have in Nigeria have Western education, which is not part of their philosophy, that all of this needs to be wiped out for their occupation. And having a whole country like Afghanistan under their control with the opportunity for them to produce hard drugs and sell as a source of foreign exchange earning and cheap access to arms from Pakistan and India, then the target is to collapse Nigeria. And this has been exacerbated by the international community that also funding and equipping young terrorists from Senegal, Mauritania, Mali, and the rest to come well, your into... Well, there will always be questions, uh, pardon me, yeah. about what we have done with this information. You seem to have, I mean, all of this information, quite extensive, I must add. And for a lot of Nigerians, they're hearing this for the first time. But there will always be questions as to what we have done with that, you know, retinue, that rich information which we have. Now, what we have done up to this moment is a direct contact warfare a manual effort to stop their ingress into Nigeria. But what we really need to do is to go digital and to develop an international partnership in terms of the level of intelligence and non-occupation uh, defense pact. If a small Cameroon can have a defense pact with, Cam with France and today have sufficient Apache helicopters that can bring down our our aircraft have anti-tank missiles stationed in Cameroon. Nigeria can't even prosecute a war with, against Cameroon. 
So here is a situation where Nigeria needs to have a non-occupation defense pact. Non-occupation means we don't give them a territory for them to occupy, but to share intelligence with us, to share uh, a, a non-contact warfare, like the use of drones and technical technology. If we don't adapt technology and decide to stay on the manual uh, methods of warfare, you will always have a challenge. So I think that Nigeria has a core responsibility to review her foreign policy from this non-aligned status to strategic alignment, right. particularly with nations who are themselves not having a direct interest on the mineral resource base of our country. I always give an example of Turkey. I give it for those who are Muslims, and I give example another example, Israel, those who are Christians. Any one of these two countries have not invested directly in a destabilization of Nigeria in order to assess our rich mineral belts, like all these, our uh, tantalite belts, coal town, platinum, gold, titanium, and the list is endless. But as far as people show interest, and international communities decide that anywhere there's wealth in West Africa or in Africa, as it were, it should become a source of pain and agony. And I'm sorry, I, I, just, pardon me to, to cut in. Did you say they have invested extensively in the destabilization? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And do you have the proof average, of all of this? You see, you see those young people who come on bikes into Nigeria and kill and go? They are paid $120 a week. Their responsibility you have, is to you kill. You have proof of, of, of this. Of, of course, of course. I'm even speaking beyond what I should speak in security. When I become president of Nigeria, I know the countries to engage to put an end to this. It's okay. deliberate. You know, another form of engagement, really. Uh, yes. yes, there's a kinetic aspect to technology, but there's also the, what we can call it non kinetic, as, as it is said. And that, that talks about the economic indices of a, of a nation. Uh, talk about human capital development, education, employment, for example. You have overseen a state which has the third highest unemployment rate in Nigeria, uh, as at the last time. Cross River had 53.65 unemployment rate. That's way higher than the national average. So I've, coming from that experience, really, uh, what can you then do in a nation of 200 million when, for your state, the unemployment rate was over 50? I ask you a question. Where was that statistics from a this day newspaper? Where was, where was it established? I think you're talking of many, many years ago. I've investigated that statistics. If I ask you a question, what's the population of crossover? Please answer me, what's the population of crossover? This is an MBS figure. Do you have yeah. an alternative figure? What is of the unemployment rate? Of course, I do. I, I do. So what is one your unemployment of, one, rate? One of, one, of the greatest, one of the greatest challenges of our times is throwing up statistics and data without proper study. I okay, so tell us, what is your I, unemployment rate? Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to that. I give you, I give you the uh, analogy to give you the figure. I came into a state that had 35 years embargo on employment. I lifted the embargo. I did 5,000 jobs for new teachers. I opened up suburb and created non-teaching staff, 2,500. I brought in a large number of people who, uh, who were adjunct staff. I converted them to permanent staff. The whole of water board, I brought them back on the CRGIS. I got them in as, as staff of the ministry. And above all, opened up the Teachers Continuous Training Institute. Then created 18,000 jobs through the facilitation of appointments into government. The statistics dropped dramatically to about 32%. And so for somebody so, to come and, as of today, to come and present you're saying that your unemployment me, rate is less than the national average? Yes, of course it's less. Because if you come to Cross River State, I don't know of any young man who is not engaged in one way or the other. With the construction well, we, and really fabrication academy. We really love to see that data, uh, Your Excellency. And clearly this is an ongoing conversation. So I'm hoping that the next time we speak, at least we'll have access to that data. Quite a number of issues I will to not, bring. I will not wait for the on. next time. I will send my state statistician to come before you and present you the statistics Fantastic. of our state. We, we look recruit. forward to that. But, but at this point, uh, we have to anchor. It's, it's always quite interesting speaking with you on issues of national development. But hopefully we'll know, do this another time. but this is too time. short. But we have this to is run too short. now. <laughs> I know, that's how time flies. When my you stomach have is full to tell Nigerians what I can do differently. Uh, well, we oh have my the coming gosh. days to do that. But okay, we have to please, run we now. will.
I want right, to thank, thank you, so you much. as always for joining us. Uh, but you are a very smooth person for Nigeria. Thank you. Professor Ben Ayade is the governor of Cross River State and he is uh, vying for the number one seat in the nation. Thank you again, Your Excellency. Well, that has been the show for tonight. Time is not always our friend, but we're back tomorrow. So please stay with us on Channels Television, your home for the news. I'm Coyote Okikiri. Good night.